now take a look at the syslog implementation, but before doing so, we just wanted to show you one other way you can run bash shell scripts using cron, and that is to prefix the shell script with the source command or dot. That's nano etc cron tab, the general system wide cron file. And this is on the remote server. We need to do it locally. And for example, for the ping test, if you prefix the shell script with a dot, that means to source it, or the keyword source. Either or will ensure that the command runs successfully. Ditto for the remote user student1. Let's su in as student1, and then cron tab e, which takes us into vi. And we execute export, then cron tab e again, and change this to source. And we'll check up on the cron item throughout the rest of our studies. So with that said, we need to look at syslog. Syslog handles logging. And it does so by supporting two facilities, or two protocols, Unix domain sockets via the dev log interface, as well as internet sockets using the UDP protocol, port 514 to be specific. So it handles all of the logging on the system. There is a subsystem, KLogD, or kernel logger, which is used exclusively by the kernel to log. But apart from that, the programs on the system will log through syslog, unless, of course, the program has its own logging facility, such as Apache and others. But by and large, logging is handled through syslog. Syslog is implemented on this particular box, in Red Hat Enterprise 5 as the sysklogd package. And we can find out more information about the package using the RPM utility locally. And the version will be returned once RPM queries its database of packages. So this is the package. That's RPM query list sysklogd. And here are the important items. Since syslog is responsible for logging information for multiple programs, it has a log rotate entry in the etc log rotate .d entry, uh, file, or directory that is. There's a file in there which contains the rules for log rotation. In the next section, we'll look at log rotation, where we'll study this file to see the directives that have been specified. When the system is booted, syslog starts via the initialization script, syslog, and there's a sysconfig item that you can edit to turn on or off various settings, including the ability to bind to UDP. The primary configuration file, however, is located in ETC, and it's called syslog.conf. This file contains the various rules that syslog uses to route information to different files. There's also the klogd component, which we mentioned, which is used by the kernel to log, exclusively of syslogd, the main binary used to log information, as well as documentation. So the main binary is syslogd. It reads etc syslog.conf. Optional startup information is placed in etc sysconfig syslog. An initialization entry is in init.d, and a log rotate entry is in the log rotate.d directory. So syslog logs daemon information, but how exactly does it do so? Well, we'll get that into that in a second. Let's just list one of the other features. That is the ability to log to local and remote targets. By default, syslog logs locally to a file usually beneath the var log directory tree, but can optionally log to a remote host running syslog. 
using internet sockets. So now back to the primary configuration file, the rules file, etcsyslog.conf. This is the primary file where you spend most of your time. Now we're going to focus on the remote server's syslog.conf file because it's pristine. The local server has entries from previous studies. A brief look at syslog.conf will reveal as such. The default settings are in, but we've also got a rule for Linux CBT Deb 2 from our Debian training and other items. So to take advantage of a fresh Red Hat Enterprise 5 syslog configuration file, we're going to work on Linux CBT Serve 4. So that's SUN and then nano etc syslog.conf. It's installed by default. Hash marks indicate comments when they begin a line, so this kernel entry is commented. As we've mentioned, kernel logging is handled by the KLogD daemon, so there's no need to turn on the facility here unless you need additional information routed elsewhere, apart from the standard kernel output locations. Now, a standard syslog file consists of rules and targets. On the left-hand side, you find rules, one or more. The right-hand side, you find targets. So standard syslog.conf file contains rules and targets. But rules can be further broken down into separate components. And they include the following, facilities and levels. This is the main routing capability of syslog. Syslog is able to route messages based on facilities and levels. Facilities are tied to applications and or daemons. So we'll just indicate by specifying an error that it's tied to application slash daemon slash network device, etc. So a given device, application, or daemon is going to report its information using a facility. A facility provides the general way to route information. All facilities share a set number of levels in common, and they vary the level of severity of the message. So levels correspond to levels of importance, or importance of message. And the importance level ranges from 0 through 7, with 0 meaning debug and 7 meaning emergency. So let's list those levels. Beginning at 7 for an emergency message, followed by 6 for alert messages, which are not as critical as emergency messages, but generally indicates a level of criticality that's worth exploration. The fifth level is critical, followed by error, then warning, notice, informational, and last but not least, debug. So from the perspective of syslog and syslog supported applications, they'll use a facility followed by one or more levels. And by one or more, we mean the following. The lower the level number, such as zero for debug, the more information. So let's just indicate more information. However, as you go up to higher levels, less information. But this does not say that the debug level is more important than the emergency level. Quite the contrary. When you receive emergency or higher level messages, they're more important than general debug level messages. And when configuring syslog, you should be sure to specify a meaningful level so you don't in end up with superfluous information. So for example, it's unideal to log at the debug level unless you're truly debugging. It may be more ideal to log at info, notice, or warning and suppress, as a result, the amount of information that you receive. Now, again, the lower the level that you indicate to log, the more information you'll receive.
If you log at debug, you'll receive all messages, info, and higher. If you log at info, you'll receive all messages, info, and higher. And write up the chain up to emergency. So if you log at the critical level, you will not see error down to debug, but will see critical up to emergency. And that's how syslog facilities work. So with that said, let's discuss targets. Targets tend to be the following. File, such as var log messages. TTY, such as dev console, or even dev TTY1. The dev console will report to all consoles, all connected consoles, as well as remote hosts indicated with the at symbol and the IP address of the remote host, which provides a means for you a means for you to log information across the wire using UDP. So again, let's step back and just imagine how syslog messages are routed. The daemon receives messages based on facilities. Facilities are tied to applications, daemons, network devices, etc. And there are many facilities. Each facility supports eight levels, zero through seven, with zero meaning more information, seven meaning less information, but more important information. Once the information has been parsed, it needs to be sent to a target, either a file, a TTY, a remote host. You may optionally send to multiple targets simultaneously by indicating multiple rules or specifying on the right hand side of your rule multiple targets separated by commas. You may also specify multiple facilities and levels on the left hand side by delimiting them by comma, which leads us back to the etc syslog.conf file. Notice for this first uncommented rule, the facility is undefined, so it, or it's defined as all using a catch-all asterisk, meaning for any facility. So asterisk equals catch-all slash wildcard to mean any facility or level, depending on where it's specified. In this particular case, star.info means any facility at the info level will ultimately be logged to var log messages with the exception of mail related messages, anything dot none means not to log, as well as authprive dot none, as well as cron dot none. So let's just indicate as well that dot none equals rule to exclude or exclusion rule. When you see dot none in a rule, it means to exclude those messages. So if a message comes in at any facility with the exception of mail, which means mail generated messages, authprov, and cron at the info level, those messages will be sent to varlog messages. Again, back to our level 0 through 7, if a message comes in at the info level, which is level number 1, it also means all levels 2 through 7 will be recorded. Not debug, however. Just info up through emergency, which is a pretty low level to begin with. This also explains why the Varlog messages file tends to be populated with a lot of information because it expects and logs information from various facilities minus what we saw, mail off, prive, and cron at the info level, which is pretty verbose. Let's continue exploring the rules. Now we did mention that off prive nothing goes to Varlog messages, which means if you authenticate using a facility that logs using off prive such as SSH, don't expect to see the message in, in Varlog messages, at least not on Red Hat Enterprise. However, below we see authprive.star, which means the facility dot any level, which means any level from debug through emergency, will end up in Varlog secure. So when you do authenticate to this enterprise box, expect to find authentication related messages in Varlog secure. And a separate window will confirm that. Let's navigate to Varlog and LSL secure and there we see the file secure and if we are root or root equivalent we will be able to examine the contents and here we see all of the SSH instances user deletions and anything that would make use of the authprov facility let's move forward messages for mail if the facility is mail regardless of the mailer postfix, qmail, sendmail 
and the level is anything. That's what the wildcard means. The message is sent to var log mail log, and it's synced on disk to improve performance, since mail logs tend to be pretty big. Cron-related items. Whenever jobs are run via cron, cron makes use of the cron facility. It's a reserve facility, and all levels of cron will be logged to var log cron. Any facility that reports at the emergency level will be sent everywhere, which means everywhere possible, all of the TTYs, as well as all of the possible open log files, such as var log messages and so on. For news, we see UCP news at the critical level and higher gets logged to var log spooler. And local 7 is the boot log route or router. Now what about various facilities? What facilities are available to us? If you man syslog or get mansyslog.conf, you'll get a sense for the supported facilities and levels. Let's just note that. Mansyslog.conf to learn about the supported facilities and levels. So back to our shell window and you'll see, for example, the following facilities. Authprive, Auth, Cron Demon, Kernel, LPR for printing, mail, mark, news, security, which is the same as auth, syslog, user, so on and so forth. When you're logging from a network infrastructure device, chances are you're going to make use of the local facility for which local 0 through 7 are supported. But from our configuration file, syslog.conf, we know that local 7 is being used. Let's cat the contents of etc syslog.conf once more just to refresh your memory and you see local 7.star contains boot items. So we really have available to us local 0 through 6 for rerouting, let's say, foreign devices like networking devices. Additionally, the syslog.conf documentation includes the various priorities, which we've described from debug all the way through emergency or zero up through to eight, up to seven, that is, for eight levels. So there's no need to memorize the different facilities and levels. Here are the actions. This is what we call targets. You can send to a regular file, to a main pipe, to a remote machine using a prefix of at, to a list of logged in users, to dev console we saw above. It's pretty straightforward. On the left hand side you have your rule, and on the right hand side you have your target, which your documentation labels slightly differently as actions. So with that said, let us make a modification to our infrastructure device, the Cisco router, to cause it to log to the local system, which will cause us to have to do a couple things. So our first task is to enable logging for, and will enable UDP logging, which means internet socket logging, for remote Cisco gateway, which is located at the following IP address. This is a multi-step task because first and foremost we need to set up the pristine syslog configuration to listen to UDP port 514. To confirm, we can use netstat anywhere grep 514. This reveals UDP 514 listeners, or listeners, and since there can only be one listener at a given time to a given socket. So let's try this from the shell to see if it's listening, and there you see grep returned nothing. And in that's that anyway, we will return all of the UDP listeners, but 514 is not enabled. We need to enable it, and it's disabled by default for security reasons. So step B is to nano the etc sysconfig. Sysconfig is a repository for startup configuration files for demons within Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And we'll modify the syslog file in etc 
and this is the syslog config file. We mean the sysconfig syslog configuration file. We want to alter the syslog startup options to include dash r. Dash r ensures that the service when restarted binds itself to UDP socket 514. So modify etc sysconfig syslog and include the dash r option for the variable syslog d underscore options. So append or set syslog d options equal to dash r as an option. And it's between double quotes, so let's just indicate as such. And then, of course, restart the syslog instance. Restart syslog and confirm UDP 514 listener. If we don't follow these steps, or if we don't enable UDP 514, we will be unable to log from across the wire. So we'll turn on dash R, then exit. The M0 ensures mark messages are turned off so they don't appear in the logs. And then we will execute service, and service is a facility provided by Red Hat to ensure that you can manage your services, starting them, stopping them, restarting them, and so on. I will execute syslog, restart. Again, no need to memorize the service name. If you take a look at etc in lit.d where the initialization script resides, syslog, this is the name of the service that you pass in to the service command. So service syslog restart restarts the service. Now let's re-execute netstat and ul. We will find that port 514 is available. We can grep it out to suppress the output. And there you see 514. And if we turn on option P with the netstat command, you'll see that syslog D with process ID 6202 is responsible for 514. So now syslog will accept messages from remote devices or remote syslog capable clients, whether devices, other operating systems, what have you. So the next step, now that we've confirmed it, and we'll just list this as C1, confirm using netstat and you will grab 514 and it should return the syslog listener. The next step is to configure the router. So step D, configure the router, which means we'll need to SSH into it and enable the appropriate level. Now we know local 0 through 6 are available. We need to pick one, perhaps local 0. Configure the router using facility local 0 and level info so that we get a lot of information. And then step E will be to configure syslog.conf, that's etc syslog.conf to accept local 0 dot info or local 0 dot star and to route that information to an appropriate file such as cisco router dot log or whatever suits your environment. So with that said, let's connect to the default gateway from one of our free windows. Let's SSH as myself to the following address. We'll have to accept the public key. And now it lets us in. Let's show run include log or show log. Either way will reveal the logging settings. And we see that logging is currently configured to an IP address of dot one seventy five. The facility is proper and the trap level is set to warnings. We'll have to change it to informational to get more information. So let's config T logging facility local zero that's set so we'll set login monitor and if you log in question you'll see different items. We can log in trap and we'll set it to info and then we'll set the IP address of the logging host to 192.168.75. In this case, for our remote system, 199. 
we'll return to the main area and show run include log again where we'll see that we've now set the host to 199 but we should also remove the other host so let's config t because the router will attempt to log to the other host and we'll just indicate a no logging host 175 and again logging help will return the various useful information you can also set the terminal line logging if you'd like so with that said we should be able to log to our local system and we can confirm just by showing show run include log or show log either or will show the logging information and you'll see the level for the different areas the router has the ability to log to the console the monitor to the buffer which is memory and to various destinations let's write memory to save the changes and then update the remote systems configuration by modifying etc syslog.conf towards the bottom we'll include a comment and it's going to be for local zero dot star dot star will accept any level whether it's warning info debug critical emergency so on I will tab all the way over just to keep it consistent and send the file to var log cisco router dot log and be sure to bring everything onto one line we'll exit to save the changes and we have to restart the syslog daemon reload would also work restart or reload syslog using of course service syslog restart so let's go ahead and give that a try service syslog restart don't worry about creating the log file syslog will take care of that for you once it's received data from the logging source so with that said let's confirm as such by lsltr and var log and there's the cisco router log file it's currently empty however we need to generate activity in order to see it and again just confirm the logging settings show run include log for example ensure that your Cisco router is logging using the appropriate timestamp for your zone and other information so the offset from GMT timestamp representation the precision of the time so on and so forth so we're logging to 199 local zero is our facility our logging trap will be info and for other facilities like monitor we can also set the monitor level to be informational so we get more information again you see the eight supported levels of syslog even with the cisco configuration if you co configure an emergency for example it's set to zero which is the reverse of the way it's represented in linux and unix debugging is set to seven nonetheless the, the concept is still the same the lower the level or the more information it produces the, the higher level of verbosity will create more information not necessarily more critical information but will create more log file information an ideal level for a router is informational or notifications but if you see that you're getting too much information then consider perhaps warnings or even emergencies if you don't want too much information from your router now there's one other thing you should note and that is the IP table software is turned on which will prevent the receipt of some of the messages but the file is created but it will remain at zero bytes until we have either disabled or inserted a rule so look the LSLTR shows it's zero but IP tables dash upper L shows the input chain contains rules blocking the traffic so for example if we were to temporarily flush temporarily flush or accept the UDP traffic we'd get the information so let's IP tables and we're going to insert at line number one into the input chain or we could append either one would work towards the end of the chain because everything else will be dropped by the last rule for ICMP and for other traffic anyway so if we squeezed it in or flush the, tr the tables we'd be able to see information in the log file let's go ahead and just flush it Now let's IP tables list.
a little flush again. Or well, in fact, let's just look at it again. Sometimes it takes a second, and now it's clean. So we'll receive information momentarily into our var log, Cisco log file. Now let's take a look again. Now we finally got some data. So a less of the Cisco router dot log file reveals information regarding the fact that the router was configured. And over time this file will grow. So throughout our studies, just like with other things, we'll check in to see what other useful information it's picked up. So again, just to quickly recap, syslog accepts facilities and levels. It accepts wildcards such as dot none as well as asterisk. It also allows you to combine multiple facilities. You can indicate a target such as a file, a TTY, a remote host. On the right hand side, there are some free facilities for you to route information to such as locals 0 through 7, minus 7 since it's used for the boot.log, and it's really customizable. Now we're going to be looking at log rotation next to show you how the log files are managed so that they don't get out of control or out of hand or become terribly difficult to manage because of their size.